Hello guys, welcome to yet another video where we will be discussing SLO 10 and SLO 11 for the FRCAM final single best answer exams. Here we'll look at few questions related to critical appraisal and quality improvement projects and I hope that you find this video useful. If you do find it useful, please hit that subscribe button and click on the like, hit the notification bell as well. Let us look at what the college regulation shows in terms of 10 questions which will be asked from SLO 10 and SLO 11. SLO 10 diagnostic methodologies, randomized controlled trials, systematic review, statistical techniques, quality improvement theory and methods, principles of measurement for improvement, measures and methods of assessing variation. This is what the regulation says. Before I begin, I like this quote of Edwards Deming, in God we trust, all of this must bring data. Yeah, it is true. In God we trust, everything else in medicine should be shown with evidence. So without wasting further time, let us look at question number one. One patient agrees to enter a trial in which the patients with DVT will be treated with rivaroxaban and aspirin versus rivaroxaban and placebo. An envelope is given to him with the group assigned. This process of using an envelope is known as randomization, blinding, concealment, recruitment, clustering. Take a 10 second pause and then we will look at the answer. So what is this happening? What are we doing? We are enrolling the patients. We are enrolling the patients. This is before the trial has begun. So when we are enrolling the patient, an envelope which is sealed and a group written is given to the patient so that the patient is not aware which group he is going to land up. This is known as concealed allocation. Concealed allocation is the right answer. That's C, concealment. Randomization happens after you have started the trial so uh, i mean say after the enrollment you randomize it to the different groups or different arms and there the process is known as blinding recruitment is nothing but allocation clustering is a term used for sampling let us now look at question number two Demographic data table 1 states age, sex, other comorbid conditions and several other features of the study group and control group. There is third column with p-values in this table. You state there are no co-founders as 45 males are in the study group and 45 males are in control group. p-value is less than 0 0.05, p-value is greater than 0 0.05. All confounding variables were taken into account. The recruitment was done with sealed envelopes. Take a 10 second pause. We'll discuss this in a bit detail later. So what do you understand by a demographic data? Demographic data table is the first table always given in a trial. It puts up the two groups and compares their demographic data. So the age, sex, uh, race, ethnicity, hypertension, diabetes, medications, etc, etc. But no table can take account for all confounding variables. I don't think so. You can actually take into account for every confounding variable because there will be differences. There will be differences and uh, numbers actually are not important 45 in this group 45 in this group that's not important there may be 10 in this group and 20 in this group but if the third column the p-value is important over there so always check for p-value or confidence interval given in the third column so we have now narrowed it down to p-value of less than 0 0.05 and p-value of greater than 0 0.05 so let us understand this concept of p-value what do you think is p-value? p-value is the probability that thing has happened by chance. So the relationship between two groups is significant because p-value is less than 0 0.05. The chance, the probability of a chance is less than 5%. That is p-value. So 
and what is a confidence interval confidence interval as per the textbook definition is the range of values in which the true population value lies uh, let me simplify this confidence interval is a 95 percent confidence interval is no matter how often you do the trial with the same design in any part of the world there is a 95 percent chance that the population value will lie or the value you will obtain will lie within this range so that is confidence interval it gives me statistical significance plus clinical significance whereas p-value just gives me statistical significance so do i want to see a difference in the two group when you get the result yes so p-value should be less than 0.05 but in the demographic data do i want to see difference between the two groups no so the p-value should be greater than 0.05 and that is the answer option number three let us now look at question three we screen for PE in pregnancy with leg swelling using a Doppler scan and if DVT is proven, anticoagulants are prescribed for a likely PE. No further investigations for PE is necessary. In statistical terms, the positive Doppler scan for DVT serves as clinical endpoint, imaging endpoint, diagnostic marker, surrogate endpoint, positive endpoint. Take a 10 second pause, think about it and then we will discuss the answer. For suspected pulmonary embolism in pregnancy, that is correct. The Green Book guideline says that do a Doppler scan for DVT and if that's proven the patient is having a DVT, start them on the treatment. You don't need any further treatment. So what does that mean? I have used a nearest or a surrogate marker assuming that if they if the lady has a clot in the leg she has clot in the lung so the answer over here is in statistical term it is surrogate and point rest all options are wrong let us now look at question number four you are at a journal club with colleagues and are discussing the subarachnoid cases you have seen in the light of recent Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule half of you agree that worst headache of my life demands a workup whereas Rest disagree with this old book knowledge. In statistics, what could be inferred? Confidence interval is 50%. Kappa coefficient is 0.5. It is an unreliable finding. It is specific but not sensitive. It is sensitive but not specific. Take your 10 seconds and we'll get back to the answer soon. Yes, the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule is something which has come up in low risk patients. We can use this rule and I have written down a paper with regards to this as well where we evaluated the rule in Luton Dunstable Hospital. It's quite sensitive, 100% sensitive in low risk patients. But uh, let us now look, get back to the question. What do you understand by kappa coefficient? Kappa coefficient is the inter-rater reliability so I get some result then you do the same study and you get some result how reliable is my result with your result do you agree with what I say said and how much do you agree that is kappa coefficient or correlation coefficient uh, so if you agree hundred percent it is kappa coefficient of one but if you agree fifty percent which is moderate correlation it is 0.5 so the correct answer over here is kappa coefficient is 0.5 and it is true in real real life as well the kappa coefficient for this particular statement worst headache of my life is 0.5 percent so let us now look at question number five the cutoff value of troponin in your department is 14 the new study suggests that this cutoff value is unreliable your ED and lab has decided that we decrease the cutoff to 12 by reducing the cutoff, what are we doing statistically? Specificity is increased, positive prediction value will increase, prevalence of the diagnosis will increase, biases will be reduced, type 1 error will result. Take your 10 seconds, we'll discuss the answer soon.
Before we move to the answer, I want you to understand the terms sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is the ratio of all people with true positives upon all people with the disease. So this is a ratio. If you draw a two by two table where you put the disease positive, negative and uh, the test positive, negative, you will get true positive, true negative, false positive and false negative. So if you define the term that way, it becomes more easy. For example, how do you define specificity? Specificity, specificity is defined as people which are true negative for the disease and those people who do not have the disease. They may include a false positive as well plus true negative. So that way it's defined. Uh, so when you are reducing from 14 to 12, what you will get? You will get more patients. That means there will be a lot of false positives. That means you are increasing the sensitivity of the test, but you are getting a lot of false positive and that is called as type 1 error. So type 1 error will result. Let us now look at question number 6. You are reviewing a meta-analysis. You notice a diagram as shown in this image. The, this depicts presence of allocation bias, poor randomization, publication bias, attrition bias, cluster samples. You take a 10 second pause and get the answer. Well, before we go ahead with the answer, what type of graph is this? This is called as a funnel plot. A funnel plot is used before you start doing the analysis. So the funnel plot is very useful to find something called as publication bias. So this chart depicts the funnel plot. The funnel plot is used to put out the studies and it should be equally distributed along that central line. When you see it, a lot of clustered results on one side there is obviously a publication bias so that is the answer what do you understand by attrition bias attrition bias is that some people have dropped out of the study and are not considered in the final analysis that's called as the per protocol analysis that means people who have followed the protocol and have not deviated from the protocol are included in the final analysis whereas the intention to treat analysis is used when everybody who's enrolled in the study is used for the final analysis. Now let us look at question number seven. Systematic review serves as grade one ranking evidence. The result of meta-analysis are generally presented in the form of funnel plot, blobogram, box and whisker plot, bar chart, Gantt chart. Take your 10 seconds and we'll look at the answer soon. So the results of the meta-analysis are usually presented with a blobogram or we call it as forest plot. Box and whisker plot is not used, it shows confidence interval. Gantt chart is used in your quality improvement project which shows a timeline of event. Funnel plot we have seen in the previous question. Now let us look at question number 8. Quality improvement projects will involve application of certain changes that will that will involve the plan do study act model what is not a part of measurement in a quality improvement project obtaining just enough data sequentially obtaining 100 percent data that is available and relevant hypothesis is flexible acceptance of consistent variation run chart or statistical process control charts are used take your 10 second pause and then we will look at the answer So remember, a quality improvement project will start with a problem. Then you will analyze it as what has caused the problem. So what has caused the problem, you will draw the fishbone diagram or we also call it as Ishikawa diagram. And then you ask five whys for the things and you come to the causes. You 
try to do a Pareto analysis that is the 80-20 principle and try to eliminate one cause and then you do a plan do study act model and you analyze the data when you're analyzing your hypothesis should always be flexible and you need to accept consistent variation you can do a statistical process control chart which can be useful and don't try to obtain 100% of the data 100% of data is not necessary in a PDSS model what you need is just enough data sequentially so what is not a part of it that is your 100% data is not a part of it that's all for this module I will see you in the next module where we will discuss about the patient flow process and leading the ship till then happy studying good luck for your exams stay safe and 